Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning uh, and to be talking to you about communication issues. Now, 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 my main job is to focus on sort of the biomedical aspects of drug abuse and focus on prevention and treatment in population health, so it was really a treat to be asked to come and speak to you about something that touches on those issues, and I'm going to weave it back into the addiction field because that's, that's what I'm, I'm expert in, and that's where I'm, my, my uh, focus has been. But it's a little bit separate from my regular day job. So I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk to you about some of the broad definitional issues. This taps into some of my previous work, working with Dr. Linda Kotler and others on how we go about diagnosing substance use disorders. And so uh, it was a pleasure to think through some of those issues. And, I'll, and I have a little story for you about how we wrestled with language when it came to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5 and uh, coming up with a way to categorize substance use disorders in a less stigmatizing, with less stigmatizing language. Now, I, I was really, it was really a pleasure to listen to the opening panel today, and I really think it set a, a wonderful stage. I was very grateful that the examples of communication included not just some of the really horrific examples of miscommunication, poor communication, but some very positive examples. I certainly agree with the summary that it's a bit of a crapshoot when you go to a new healthcare provider. While there is some training in communication issues in, in all healthcare education, it is quite clearly woefully inadequate. So I look forward to hearing about the, the recommendations coming out of this panel and other similar panels on health literacy about how we can improve that education, whether that's at the primary education level during postgraduate years or through continuing education during person's professional lives or possibly through system level approaches that include things like Yelp reviews that influence behavior or financing systems that reward people. You don't need a lot of reward actually to change behavior. That's one of the lessons from our research at NIDA and the NIH is that very minimal rewards and minimal financial incentives can shape behavior in major ways. So I look forward to those, those thoughts and some of those solutions coming out this afternoon. I also was remarkably impressed by thinking about how much stress can impede communication. Uh, and while persons with mental illnesses may have particular and undue stresses, I'm not sure that that's unique to mental illness. I think somebody with a cancer diagnosis is pretty darn stressed out when they go to a, a, a physician's office or see a nurse practitioner and may forget the 25 questions and 25 bits of information that they wanted to provide. So while we are focusing on uh, mental illness and mental health issues today, uh, some of these are generic across all the health literacy field. And so the panel is really well equipped to uh, take the lessons from other areas of health and, and perhaps just apply them to uh, what we are loosely calling behavioral health. Uh, uh, I, I, the, the other key lesson from the an, initial speakers that struck me was I think sort of communication and, and etiquette 101 might be what we need to teach. Um, I was sort of impressed that an awful lot of what was missing was just sort of basic kindness and basic respect. And uh, not everyone has those traits inherently. So we hope that those persons will go as physicians will end up in pathology or radiology. <laughs> uh, uh, but for those, uh, or, or uh, but, but even for those who have at least average abilities in those, in those areas and were raised well by their moms and grandmas, uh, that there are opportunities for improvements and focusing on not letting the stress of the fact that you only have three minutes with the patient and you got to get the most out of it, not let that interfere with actually calmly listening and being focused and attentive uh, like you would with anybody who is bringing something important to you. I, I'm sure that that will uh, be part of the, the, the lessons from today, and it certainly was for me just list, listening this morning. Okay, now what do I have for you today? Well, my first question was, I, I was sort of struck just even the title that I was given for my presentation on behavioral health and mental health. Um, I, I see that as a little bit duplicative as a title. Uh, behavioral health uh, uh, is a global term that we use as a shorthand for a br very broad range of conditions. 
And like other forms of shorthand, it has severe limitations. It doesn't at all provide the nuance or detail that we need to make complex decisions. On the other hand, when you only have three seconds to explain something, it's a useful tool as a, as a broad, encompassing term that includes both mental illnesses and substance use disorders. I might say that substance use disorders are part of mental illness, so maybe that in and of itself is duplicative. But as a psychiatrist, I have found that to be necessary to remind people that the addictive disorders are part of mental illness. I need to do that often. I'm going to talk a little bit about implications for communication. We'll talk a bit about stigma as I think an underlying issue here. And some of the reasons for uh, separating out behavioral health have to do with stigma. But in a way, the separations may promote stigma, as we heard from uh, Dr. Smith, a suggestion of that in terms of the impediments of communication between behavioral health specialists, particularly psychiatrists and family practice, for example. Now, I've already suggested to you that behavioral health is a broad label. I just point out to you, well, when I say behavior, I'm thinking about in the health area, things like medication adherence. Well, that's not really behavioral health in the sense of a diagnosis, but it is part of behavior, and it's a key part of medical care. Is that part of behavioral health? Not really, but it's an ancillary-related term. Typically, when you hear the term behavioral health, that really is just a, a way to communicate a single label for a very broad range of diagnoses. I will say I face the same issue in the addiction field. People talk about substance use and substance disorders. Well, sometimes they want to include tobacco and sometimes they don't. Sometimes when they say uh, addictive disorders, they really mean illicit substances, and they don't even want to include alcohol. So e even in uh, uh, even narrow fields, we get into trouble with our, our, our overarching labels because we may not share the definition among, our, among ourselves. So I think it's incumbent on those that use terms like behavioral health, particularly if you're going to publish and write with that, that you define it somewhere. We may not agree on what the boundaries are around it, but if you define it, I can at least accept that that's what you mean when you use that term. And in general, I think of it as a global term that encompasses all of mental illness, including addictive disorders. Now, these are extremely common conditions. Uh, we certainly know from broad-based surveys like the National Survey on Drug Use and Health that a very large number of persons uh, are affected by these conditions. Uh, it's estimated that almost half of people will experience a, uh, 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 an addictive or mental illness disorder or other mental illness disorder at some point in their lifetime, both in terms of the lifetime prevalence and current prevalences are extremely common, and, and they overlap. Uh, so that is uh, a, one of the key issues for taking care of patients with these conditions is when you discover one of them, you need to very carefully explore for the potential uh, for other uh, other disorders. And as an addiction specialist, this is, we're one of the areas that gets overlooked. So persons with major depressive disorder or persons who have schizophrenia, often their physicians or others may forget to ask about their use of alcohol, their use of tobacco, which in terms of the decreased lifespan is one of the major contributors to decreased lifespan. So these are ways that just by, uh, by, by paying attention to the comorbidity, we can improve the care. Now, the, the, the other issue, just like behavioral health is a broad category, um, when we think about what a mental illness is, that's a huge territory. It covers everything from autism and autism spectrum disorders that we've heard about today through childhood behavioral conditions uh, like conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder through Alzheimer's disease and the, the uh, dementias in, in the elderly, the serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia and other psychotic illnesses. These are an awfully broad range, and yet we somehow want to lump them together as if it was a single category. Um, each one of those deserves some separate attention and some nuance. So I remind us that even as we think in these broad categories, we need to pay attention as well to the individual needs within each of those diagnostic groups. Because they will be somewhat, while there will be a few similarities, just like I think the lessons from general health can apply to a degree, there will be nuances in terms of the specific disorders. Now, when we think about substance use disorders, I, I want to remind us that although I'm approaching this from a broad perspective, 
And I'll use a label like a diagnosis to communicate a great deal of information about somebody's loss of control over their use of a substance or their inability to stop despite the consequences, their experience of withdrawal and tolerance as physiological symptoms. But that's a shorthand for uh, uh, these disorders, which have a developmental course, have multiple causes, including environmental and biological contributors. And all of these are encompassed in this single shorthand that really doesn't do justice to the details that are necessary to design and implement a care plan for an individual. So I, I think that's always going to be the challenge, and it's a theme that I hope I'm, I'm elucidating for you, is the challenge between these labeling shorthands and the nuances and complexities that our patients uh, bring, bring into the clinical situation and trying to balance those in important ways. Now, we've heard a mention a little bit about some of the unique communication needs already, but I would point out that when it comes to uh, 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 many mental illnesses, including substance use disorders, disordered thinking is a key part of those conditions. And so that can impede the communication in a very direct way. You have somebody who literally, because of their brain condition, just can't quite hear what you're saying. That's over and above the stress of any clinical experience somebody may have. I also think uh, we heard a wonderful example from uh, Kate about how the stress of having the police in your home when what you'd really want to do is yell and scream and just spew all of the stress you've been under to them, not a helpful or useful way because you have to control yourself in order to be successful in navigating that situation. I think that we forget of that the stress that family members and loved ones and caretakers experience can also impede the communication. And I'm really glad we're going to hear about the relationship of cognitive issues with communication because I, I, I think there's an interaction and I look forward to the next speakers going into that in some detail. There's also issues around stigma that impede this in many ways, both obvious and indirect. And I would point out that stigma can exist at all levels. Our patients themselves may have stigma about their condition. I, I think that's not completely limited to behavioral health, but it is more accentuated in behavioral health. I think there's uh, f frequently an embarrassment about having a behavioral health disorder, whether that's an addictive disorder or a mental illness diagnosis, that requires practice to overcome. It's like other areas of fear and anxiety. With practice, it does get a little better. may not completely go away, but it can be reduced. But that stigma that patients experience and families experience is part of what we're dealing with. But I'd also point out that clinicians bring an awful lot of stigma to this as well. And so this can be at all levels. Uh, we see this in the addiction field in terms of policymakers, in terms of the issues that, are, that my patients face when they interact with the criminal justice system. Uh, and it's not always an easy solution. I was struck by Dr. Smith's comment about just make them all one big family of disorders and treat them all like the biological conditions that they are at some underlying basis. But how do you deal with the fact that police sometimes use information in a medical record to uh, do law enforcement approaches? Uh, how do we make sure that uh, health records, particularly when it comes to illegal behaviors like selling cocaine or possessing fentanyl, are uh, 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 not an impediment to seeking care and getting the care that people need. That is the balancing act and why some of the protections exist. So it's, while I, 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 I certainly agree with the notion of integration of care, uh, we need to be cautious or at least cognizant of the potential for it backfiring in certain, certain places. Uh, I, I've already suggested to you that distorted thinking can limit what can be expressed and what can be heard or understood. That happens in multiple ways. I want to talk about stigma, though, in some uh, a, a little bit additional detail. And I'm going to point it out where I think it taking place within my own field, that we see a major issue of lack of access to an effective treatment for opioid use disorder. All of us at the NIH are uh, uh, working to address our current opioid overdose crisis in the United States. We see more and more people uh, dying of drug overdoses related to either prescription opioids or illicit opioids like heroin and most recently the particularly potent illicit fentanyl and related compounds. Well, guess what? I have treatments that can help people. We have effective medications that are useful for people with these conditions. 
um, we have both agonists that replace the effects of opioids and allow people to have uh, a medically supervised care to improve their functioning, regain their lives, and enter as pro-social active members of society, no longer breaking the law, no longer putting their lives at risk with exposure to infectious diseases and turning their lives around. We also have antagonists that block the effects of the opioids. They can have a similar outcome. They're not as well studied, but they look like they can have a similar outcome. And yet, we don't have access to these, either because there aren't enough clinicians that even theoretically could provide the care in many parts of the country, or even if you go to a treatment program, this is within my own area, my own field. If I send a patient to a randomly selected treatment program for opioid use disorder, for an addiction to heroin, an addiction to prescription opioids, an addiction to fentanyl, there's only about a one in four chance that that program will offer medication-assisted treatment. Huh. I have a proven effective treatment, and yet there's only a one in four chance that I go to a place that lays itself out as providing this care will offer it. I think that's because of some of the internal stigma that uh, medication-assisted treatment faces within the treatment providers themselves. I am heartened by programs like Betty Ford and Hazleton that are sort of the stalwarts of 12-step facilitation and abstinence-based approach. That's what they, they really emphasized in their treatment programs over the years. But they were swayed by the data that showed for opioid use disorder, their patients were unsuccessful when they weren't offered medications and weren't continued on medications longer term. That they noticed that some of their patients were dying when they were released from treatment. So it had not just poor clinical outcomes, but the absolute worst clinical outcomes. Because you have people who are now off of the opioids, their tolerance is reduced, and so when they relapse, they are at exceptionally high risk for for fatal outcomes. I'm pleased to see that even those stalwarts of sort of the 12-step facilitation and absence-based approach make those changes. So that gives me hope, but we have a long way to go. Uh, So how can we begin to think about these? I think we can address attitudes, we can combat stigma and tailor communication. Certainly patients and clinicians can, the attitudes can be influenced provider attitudes, influence care, and we may be able to change this. We noticed that those clinical programs that participated in research involving buprenorphine, one of the treatments for opioid use disorder, they were more likely then to adopt that in their programs long term. So just what we learned from Rogers and the, you know, the implementation of novel approaches, the ability to sort of practice with it, in this case practice in a research paradigm, was useful for long term change. Uh, I'm also sort of a uh, 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 While coverage and the focus of opioid use disorder has historically focused on law enforcement and legal issues, we've certainly witnessed in the last few years a change so that health and healthcare are the language people are using, and I hope that this sticks for a while, um, uh, uh, because that allows us to approach this from a public health and, and population health perspective rather than a pure law enforcement as our primary policy approach. Now, there are ways to reduce stigma. I'm, I'm going to skip through this because I just have a couple minutes, and I want to tell you my last, my last story here. I want to end uh, by focusing on what we did in the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5 uh, 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 work group on substance use disorders. We were you know, challenged with what we were going to do to revise the diagnoses. Uh, the labels of substance Abuse and dependence, as in alcohol abuse, alcohol dependence, cocaine abuse, cocaine dependence, have been with us for a number of years. Uh, Some of this uh, issue around what do we call our disorders has been an issue for a long time. When we look through the literature, we found at least written discussion of this going back some 50 years. When I looked at all the different possible labels that we might consider for, hey, we had a once every 20 year opportunity to rename our diagnoses. Um, we looked at some of the history. I, I, I was able to rule out dipsomania. I was able to rule out uh, inebriety, although I kind of like that because everybody knows sobriety, but nobody is familiar with inebriety as the converse of sobriety. But I, I, I personally kind of like that, but we weren't going to call it that. Um, uh, there certainly is a spectrum of substance use issues, and that was something we wrestled with. Uh, while many of us were in favor of addiction as a label, because addiction really defines the most extreme end of the spectrum. And persons with addictive disorders are markedly impaired by their substance use and their substance use uh, 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 issues. Uh, But that's 
only the extreme end, and there's a broad range of severity when it comes to these conditions. There's now a classic study by uh, John Kelly at Harvard and colleagues that these are with clinicians. They did these vignettes where they only varied one word. They called Mr. K a substance abuser or a person with a substance use disorder. Otherwise, the description was the same. And they asked a series of questions in a typical scale form about that patient. What they noticed is even with clinicians, these are uh, 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 um, uh, mental health clinicians, they were more likely to adopt a stigmatizing attitude when the one change was just a label that identified that person as having substance abuse. So we saw that as a, as a reason for shifting the label, avoiding the term abuse. Uh, and so we came up with what we hope today is a neutral term of a substance use disorder that cuts across the full range of conditions uh, that persons that, who misuse these substances can experience uh, and maybe less stigmatizing some of the, the labels we'd heard earlier. I'll just end by highlighting what the Surgeon General uh, had in a recent Surgeon General's report around uh, sub substance use disorders, uh, that the vision was for a, uh, a reduction of stigma as a major approach. Whether this will uh, 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 be important for individuals and families, whether healthcare systems, communities. And so I think the work of this round table on communication issues fits in very nicely with what the Surgeon General highlighted is we need to improve the care of persons with addictive disorders. And uh, uh, I would suggest even more broadly for all of the behavioral health conditions that based on my quick review includes all mental illnesses and substance use disorders. Thanks very much.